Section 16 of Coningsby, or the New Generation, by Benjamin Disraeli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 4, Chapter 9. Nothing could present a greater contrast than the respective interiors of Coningsby and Beaumanoir. That air of habitual habitation, which so pleasingly distinguished the Duke's family seat, was entirely wanting at Coningsby. Everything, indeed, was vast and splendid, but it seemed rather a gala house than a dwelling, as if the grand furniture and the grand servants had all come down express from town with the grand company, and were to disappear and to be dispersed at the same time. And truly there were manifold traces of hasty and temporary arrangement, new carpets and old hangings, old paint, new gilding, battalions of odd French chairs, squadrons of queer English tables, and large tasteless lamps and tawdry chandeliers, evidently true cockneys, and only taking the air by way of change. There was, too, throughout the drawing-rooms, an absence of all those minor articles of ornamental furniture that are the offering of taste to the home we love. There were no books, neither. Few flowers, no pet animals, no portfolios of fine drawings by our English artists, like the album of the Duchess, full of sketches by Landseer and Stanfield, and their gifted brethren. Not a print, even, except portfolios of H. B.'s caricatures. The modes and manners of the house were not rural. There was nothing of the sweet order of a country life. Nobody came down to breakfast. The ladies were scarcely seen till dinner-time. They rolled about in carriages together late in the afternoon, as if they were in London, or led a sort of factitious boudoir life in their provincial dressing-rooms. The Marquis sent for Coningsby the morning after his arrival, and asked him to breakfast with him in his private rooms. Nothing could be more kind or more agreeable than his grandfather. He appeared to be interested in his grandson's progress, was glad to find Coningsby had distinguished himself at Eton, solemnly adjured him not to neglect his French. A classical education, he said, was a very admirable thing, and one which all gentlemen should enjoy. But Coningsby would find some day that there were two educations, one which his position required, another which was demanded by the world. French, my dear Harry, he continued, is the key to this second education. In a couple of years or so you will enter the world. It is a different thing to what you read about. It is a masquerade, a motley, sparkling multitude, in which you may mark all forms and colours, and listen to all sentiments and opinions, but where all you see and hear has only one object, plunder. When you get into this crowd, you will find that Greek and Latin are not so much diffused as you imagine. I was glad to hear you speaking French yesterday. Study your accent. There are a good many foreigners here with whom you may try your wing a little. Don't talk to any of them too much. Be very careful of intimacies. All the people here are good acquaintance, at least pretty well. Now here, said the Marquis, taking up a letter, and then throwing it down on the table again, now here is a man whom I should like you to know, Sidonia. He will be here in a few days. Lay yourself out for him if you have the opportunity. He is a man of rare capacity and enormously rich. No one knows the world like Sidonia. I never met his equal, and tis so pleasant to talk with one who can want nothing of you. Lord Monmouth had invited Coningsby to take a drive with him in the afternoon. The Marquis wished to show a part of his domain to the ambassadress. Only Lucretia, he said, would be with them, and there was a place for him. This invitation was readily accepted by Coningsby, who was not yet sufficiently established in the habits of the house exactly to know how to pass his morning. His friend and patron, Mr. Rigby, was entirely taken up with the Grand Duke, whom he was accompanying all over the neighbourhood, in visits to manufactures, many of which Rigby himself saw for the first time, but all of which he fluently explained to his Imperial Highness. 
In return for this, he extracted much information from the Grand Duke on Russian plans and projects, materials for a slashing article against the Russophobia that he was preparing, and in which he was to prove that Muscovite aggression was an English interest, and entirely to be explained by the want of sea-coast, which drove the Tsar, for the pure purposes of commerce, to the Baltic and the Euxine. When the hour for the drive arrived, Coningsby found Lucretia, a young girl when he had first seen her only four years back, and still his junior, in that majestic dame who had conceded a superb recognition to him the preceding eve. She really looked older than Madame Colonna, who, very beautiful, very young-looking, and mistress of the real arts of the toilet, those that cannot be detected, was not in the least altered since she first so cordially saluted Coningsby as her dear young friend at Monmouth House. The day was delightful, the park extensive and picturesque, the ambassadress sparkling with anecdote, and occasionally in a low voice breathing a diplomatic hint to Lord Monmouth, who bowed his graceful consciousness of her distinguished confidence. Coningsby occasionally took advantage of one of those moments, when the conversation ceased to be general, to address Lucretia, who replied in calm, fine smiles and in affable monosyllables. She indeed generally succeeded in conveying an impression to those she addressed, that she had never seen them before, did not care to see them now, and never wished to see them again. And all this, too, with an air of great courtesy. They arrived at the brink of a wooded bank. At their feet flowed a fine river, deep and rushing, though not broad, its opposite bank the boundary of a richly timbered park. "'Ah, this is beautiful!' exclaimed the ambassadress. "'And is that yours, Lord Monmouth?' "'Not yet,' said the Marquis. "'This is Hellingsley. It is one of the finest places in the county, with a splendid estate. Not so considerable as Coningsby, but very great.' It belongs to an old, a very old man, without a relative in the world. It is known that the estate will be sold at his death, which may be almost daily expected. Then it is mine. No one can offer for it what I can afford, for it gives me this division of the county princess. To possess Hellingsley is one of my objects. The Marquis spoke with an animation unusual with him, almost with a degree of excitement. The wind met them as they returned, the breeze blew rather freshly. Lucretia all of a sudden seemed touched with unusual emotion. She was alarmed lest Lord Monmouth should catch cold. She took a kerchief from her own well-turned throat to tie round his neck. He feebly resisted, evidently much pleased. The Princess Lucretia was highly accomplished. In the evening, having refused several distinguished guests, but instantly yielding to the request of Lord Monmouth, she sang. It was impossible to conceive a contralto of more thrilling power, or an execution more worthy of the voice. Coningsby, who was not experienced in fine singing, listened as if to a supernatural lay, but all agreed that it was of the highest class of nature and of art, and the Grand Duke was in raptures. Lucretia received even his highness's compliments with a graceful indifference. Indeed, to those who watched her demeanour, it might be remarked that she seemed to yield to none, although all bowed before her. Madame Colonna, who was always kind to Coningsby, expressed to him her gratification for the party of the morning. It must have been delightful, she assured Coningsby, for Lord Monmouth to have both Lucretia and his grandson with him. And Lucretia, too, she added, must have been so pleased. Coningsby could not make out why Madame Colonna was always intimating to him that the Princess Lucretia took such interest in his existence, looked forward with such gratification to his society, remembered with so much pleasure the past, anticipated so much happiness from the future. It appeared to him that he was to Lucretia, if not an object of repugnance, as he sometimes fancied, certainly one only of absolute indifference but he said nothing. He had already lived long enough to know that it is unwise to wish everything explained. In the meantime, his life was agreeable. Every day, he found, added to his acquaintance. He was never without a companion to ride or to shoot with, and of riding Coningsby was very fond. 
His grandfather, too, was continually giving him good-natured turns, and making him of consequence in the castle, so that all the guests were fully impressed with the importance of Lord Monmouth's grandson. Lady St. Julian's pronounced him distinguished, the ambassadress thought diplomacy should be his part, as he had a fine person and a clear brain. Madame Colonna spoke of him always as if she took intense interest in his career, and declared she liked him almost as much as Lucretia did. The Russians persisted in always styling him the young Marquis, notwithstanding the ambassador's explanations. Mrs. Guy Flouncey made a dashing attack on him, but Coningsby remembered a lesson which Lady Everingham had graciously bestowed on him. He was not to be caught again easily. Besides, Mrs. Guy Flouncey laughed a little too much and talked a little too loud. As time flew on, there were changes of visitors, chiefly among the single men. At the end of the first week after Coningsby's arrival, Lord Eskdale appeared, bringing with him Lucian Gay, and soon after followed the Marquis of Beaumanoir and Mr. Melton. These were all heroes who, in their way, interested the ladies, and whose advent was hailed with general satisfaction. Even Lucretia would relax a little to Lord Eskdale. He was one of her oldest friends, and with a simplicity of manner which amounted almost to plainness, and with rather a cynical nonchalance in his carriage towards men, Lord Eskdale was invariably a favourite with women. To be sure, his station was eminent. He was noble, and very rich, and very powerful, and these are qualities which tell as much with the softer as the harsher sex. But there are individuals with all these qualities who are nevertheless unpopular with women. Lord Eskdale was easy, knew the world thoroughly, had no prejudices, and above all had a reputation for success. A reputation for success has as much influence with women as a reputation for wealth has with men. Both reputations may be, and often are, unjust but we see persons daily make good fortunes by them all the same. Lord Eskdale was not an impostor, and though he might not have been so successful a man had he not been Lord Eskdale, still, thrown over by a revolution, he would have lighted on his legs. The arrival of this nobleman was the occasion of giving a good turn to poor Flora. He went immediately to see his friend Wilbeck and his troop. Indeed, it was a sort of society which pleased Lord Eskdale more than that which is deemed more refined. He was very sorry about La Petite, but thought that everything would come right in the long run, and told Villebecq that he was glad to hear him well spoken of here, especially by the Marquis, who seemed to take to him. As for Flora, he was entirely against her attempting the stage again, at least for the present, but as she was a good musician, he suggested to the Princess Lucretia one night that the subordinate aid of Flora might be of service to her, and permit her to favour her friends with some pieces which otherwise she must deny to them. This suggestion was successful. Flora was introduced occasionally, soon often, to their parties in the evening, and her performances were in every respect satisfactory. There was nothing to excite the jealousy of Lucretia, either in her style or her person and yet she sang well enough, and was a quiet, refined, retiring, by no means disagreeable person. She was the companion of Lucretia very often in the morning, as well as in the illumined saloon, for the princess was devoted to the art in which she excelled. This connection on the whole contributed to the happiness of poor Flora. True it was, in the evening she often found herself sitting or standing alone, and no one noticing her, she had no dazzling quality to attract men of fashion, who themselves loved to worship ever the fashionable. Even their goddesses must be a la mode. But Coningsby never omitted an opportunity to show Flora some kindness under these circumstances. He always came and talked to her, and praised her singing, and would sometimes hand her refreshments, and give her his arm if necessary. These slight attentions, coming from the grandson of Lord Monmouth, were for all the world redoubled in their value, though Flora thought only of their essential kindness, all in character with that first visit which dwelt on the poor girl's memory, though it had long ago escaped that of a visitor, for in truth Coningsby had no other impulse for his conduct but kind-heartedness. 
Thus we have attempted to give some faint idea how life glided away at the castle the first fortnight that Coningsby passed there. Perhaps we ought not to omit that Mrs. Guy Flouncey, to the infinite disgust of Lady St. Julian's, who had a daughter with her, successfully entrapped the devoted attentions of the young Marquis of Beaumanoir, who was never very backward if a lady would take trouble enough, while his friend, Mr. Melton, whose barren homage to Lady St. Julian's wished her daughter ever particularly to shun, employed all his gaiety, good humour, frivolity, and fashion in amusing that young lady, and with irresistible effect. For the rest they continued, though they had only partridges to shoot, to pass the morning without weariness. The weather was fine, the stud numerous, all might be mounted. The Grand Duke and his suite, guided by Mr. Rigby, had always some objects to visit, and railroads returned them just in time for the banquet, with an appetite which they had earned, and during which Rigby recounted their achievements and his own options. The dinner was always first-rate, the evening never failed, music, dancing, and the theatre offered great resources independently of the soul-subduing sentiment harshly called flirtation, and which is the spell of a country house. Lord Monmouth was satisfied, for he had scarcely ever felt wearied. All that he required in life was to be amused, and perhaps that was not all he required, but it was indispensable. Nor was it wonderful that on the present occasion he obtained his purpose, for there were half a hundred of the brightest eyes and quickest brains ever on the watch or the world to secure him distraction. The only circumstance that annoyed him was the non-arrival of Sidonia. Lord Monmouth could not bear to be disappointed. He could not refrain from saying, notwithstanding all the resources and all the exertions of his guests, I cannot understand why Sidonia does not come. I wish Sidonia were here. So do I, said Lord Eskdale. Sidonia is the only man who tells one anything new. We saw Sidonia at Lord Studcaster's, said Lord Beaumanoir. He told Melton he was coming here. You know he has bought all Studcaster's horses, said Mr. Melton. I wonder he does not buy Studcaster himself, said Lord Monmouth. I would if I were he. Sidonia can buy anything, he turned to Mrs. Guy Flouncey. I wonder who Sidonia is, thought Mrs. Guy Flouncey, but she was determined no one should suppose she did not know. At length one day Coningsby met Madame Colonna in the vestibule before dinner. Milor is in such good temper, Mr. Coningsby, she said. Monsieur de Sidonia has arrived. About ten minutes before dinner there was a stir in the chamber. Coningsby looked round. He saw the Grand Duke advancing, and holding out his hand in a manner the most gracious. A gentleman of distinguished air, but with his back turned to Coningsby, was bowing as he received His Highness's greeting. There was a general pause in the room. Several came forward. Even the Marquis seemed a little moved. Coningsby could not resist the impulse of curiosity to see this individual of whom he had heard so much. He glided round the room, and caught the countenance of his companion in the forest inn. He who announced to him that the age of ruins was past. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 Sidonia was descended from a very ancient and noble family of Aragon, that in the course of ages had given to the state many distinguished citizens. In the priesthood its members had been peculiarly eminent. Besides several prelates, they counted among their number an Archbishop of Toledo, and a Sidonia, in a season of great danger and difficulty, had exercised for a series of years the paramount officer of Grand Inquisitor. Yet strange as it may sound, it is nevertheless a fact, of which there is no lack of evidence, that this illustrious family during all this period, in common with two-thirds of the Aragonese nobility, secretly adhered to the ancient faith and ceremonies of their fathers, a belief in the unity of the God of Sinai, and the rites and observances of the laws of Moses. Whence came these mosaic Arabs, whose passages across the strait from Africa to Europe long preceded the invasion of the Mohammedan Arabs, it is now impossible to ascertain. 
Their traditions tell us that from time immemorial they had sojourned in Africa, and it is not improbable that they may have been the descendants of some of the earlier dispersions, like those Hebrew colonies that we find in China, and who probably emigrated from Persia in the days of the great monarchies. Whatever may have been their origin in Africa, their fortunes in southern Europe are not difficult to trace, though the annals of no race in any age can detail a history of such strange vicissitudes, or one rife with more touching and romantic incident. Their unexampled prosperity in the Spanish peninsula, and especially in the south, where they had become the principal cultivators of the soil, excited the jealousy of the Goths, and the councils of Toledo during the 6th and 7th centuries attempted by a series of decrees worthy of the barbarians who promulgated them to root the Jewish Arabs out of the land. There is no doubt the Council of Toledo led, as directly as the lust of Roderick, to the invasion of Spain by the Moslem and Arabs. The Jewish population, suffering under the most sanguinary and atrocious persecution, looked to their sympathizing brethren of the Crescent, whose camps already gleamed on the opposite shore. The overthrow of the Gothic kingdoms was as much achieved by the superior information which the Saracens received from their suffering kinsmen as by the resistless valour of the desert. The Saracen kingdoms were established, that fair and unrivalled civilization arose which preserved for Europe arts and letters when Christendom was plunged in darkness. The children of Ishmael rewarded the children of Israel with equal rights and privileges with themselves. During these halcyon centuries, it is difficult to distinguish the follower of Moses from the votary of Mahomet. Both alike built palaces, gardens, and fountains, filled equally the highest offices of the state, competed in an extensive and enlightened commerce, and rivaled each other in renowned universities. Even after the fall of the principal Moorish kingdoms, the Jews of Spain were still treated by the conquering Goths with tenderness and consideration. Their numbers, their wealth, the fact that in Aragon especially they were the proprietors of the soil, and surrounded by warlike and devoted followers, secured for them a usage which for a considerable period made them little sensible of the change of dynasties and religions but the tempest gradually gathered. As the Goths grew stronger, persecution became more bold. Where the Jewish population was scanty, they were deprived of their privileges, or obliged to conform under the title of Nuevos Cristianos. At length the union of the two crowns under Ferdinand and Isabella, and the fall of the last Moorish kingdom, brought the crisis of their fate both to the new Christians and the non-conforming Hebrew. The Inquisition appeared, the institution that had exterminated the Albigenses and had desolated Languedoc, and which, it should ever be remembered, was established in the Spanish kingdoms against the protests of the Cortes and admit the terror of the populace. The Dominicans opened their first tribunal at Seville, and it is curious that the first individuals they summoned before them were the Duke of Medina Sidonia, the Marquis of Cadiz, and the Count of Arcos, three of the most considerable personages in Spain. How many were burned alive at Seville during the first year, how many imprisoned for life, what countless thousands were visited with severe, though lighter punishments, need not be recorded here. In nothing was the Holy Office more happy than in multiform and subtle means by which they tested the sincerity of the new Christians. At length the Inquisition was to be extended to Aragon. The high-spirited nobles of that kingdom knew that its institution was for them a matter of life or death. The Cortes of Aragon appealed to the king and to the pope. They organized an extensive conspiracy. The chief inquisitor was assassinated in the cathedral of Saragossa. Alas, it was fated that in this, one of the many and continual, and continuing struggles between the rival organizations of the north and the south, the children of the sun should fall. The faggot and the San Benito were the doom of the nobles of Aragon. Those who were convicted of secret Judaism, and this scarcely three centuries ago, were dragged to the stake, 
the sons of the noblest houses in whose veins the hebrew taint could be traced had to walk in solemn procession singing psalms and confessing their faith in the religion of the fell torquemada this triumph in aragon the almost simultaneous fall of the last moorish kingdom raised the hopes of the pure christians to the highest pitch having purged the new christians they next turned their attention to the old hebrews ferdinand was resolved that the delicious air of spain should be breathed no longer by any one who did not profess the catholic faith baptism or exile was the alternative more than six hundred thousand individuals some authorities greatly increased the amount the most industrious the most intelligent and the most enlightened of spanish subjects would not desert the religion of their fathers for this they gave up the delightful land wherein they had lived for centuries the beautiful cities they had raised the universities from which christendom knew for ages its most precious lore the tombs of their ancestors the temples where they had worshipped the god for whom they had made this sacrifice they had but four months to prepare for eternal exile after a residence of as many centuries during which brief period forced sales and glutted markets virtually confiscated their property it is a calamity that the scattered nation still ranks with the desolations of nebuchadnezzar and of titus who after this should say the jews are by nature a sordid people but the spanish goth then so cruel and so haughty where is he a despised suppliant to the very race which he banished for some miserable portion of the treasure which the habits of industry have again accumulated where is that tribunal that summoned medina sidonia and cadiz to its dark inquisition where is spain where is spain its fall its unparalleled and its irremediable fall is mainly to be attributed to the expulsion of that large portion of its subjects the most industrious and intelligent who traced their origin to the mosaic and the mohammedan arabs the sidonians of aragon were nuevos cristianos some of them no doubt were burned alive at the end of the fifteenth century under the system of torquemada many of them doubtless wore the san benito but they kept their titles and estates and in time reached those great offices to which we have referred during the long disorders of the peninsular war when so many openings were offered to talent and so many opportunities seized by the adventurous a cadet of a younger branch of this family made a large fortune by military contracts and supplying the commissariat of the different armies at the peace prescient of the great financial future of europe confident in the fertility of his own genius in his original views of fiscal subjects and his knowledge of national resources this sidonia feeling that madrid or even cadiz could never be a base on which the monetary transactions of the world could be regulated resolved to emigrate to england with which he had in the course of years formed considerable commercial connections he arrived there after the peace of paris with his large capital he staked all he was worth on the waterloo loan and the event made him one of the greatest capitalists in europe no sooner was sidonia established in england than he professed judaism which torquemada flattered himself with the faggot and the san benito he had drained out of the veins of his family more than three centuries ago he sent over also for several of his brothers who were as good catholics in spain as ferdinand and isabella could have possibly desired but who made an offering in the synagogue in gratitude for their safe voyage on their arrival in england sidonia had foreseen in spain that after the exhaustion of a war of twenty-five years europe must require capital to carry on peace he reaped the due reward of his sagacity europe did require money and sidonia was ready to lend it to europe france wanted some austria more prussia a little russia a few millions sidonia could furnish them all the only country which he avoided was spain he was too well acquainted with its resources nothing too would ever tempt him to lend anything to the revolted colonies of spain prudence saved him from being a creditor of the mother country 
his Spanish pride recoiled from the rebellion of her children. It is not difficult to conceive that after having pursued the career we have intimated for about ten years, Sidonia had become one of the most considerable personages in Europe. He had established a brother, or a near relative, in whom he could confide, in most of the principal capitals. He was lord and master of the money market of the world, and of course virtually lord and master of everything else. He literally held the revenues of southern Italy in pawn, and monarchs and ministers of all countries courted his advice, and were guided by his suggestions. He was still in the vigour of life, and was not a mere money-making machine. He had a general intelligence equal to his position, and looked forward to the period when some relaxation from his vast enterprises and exertions might enable him to direct his energies to great objects of public benefit. But in the height of his vast prosperity he suddenly died, leaving only one child, a youth still of tender years, an heir to the greatest fortune in Europe, so great indeed that it could only be calculated by millions. Shut out from universities and schools, those universities and schools which were indebted for their first knowledge of ancient philosophy to the learning and enterprise of his ancestors, the young Sidonia was fortunate in the tutor whom his father had procured for him, and who devoted to his charge all the resources of his trained intellect and vast and varied erudition. A Jesuit before the Revolution, since then an exiled liberal leader, now a member of the Spanish Cortes, Rebello was always a Jew. He found in his pupil that precocity of intellectual development which is characteristic of the Arabian organization. The young Sidonia penetrated the highest mysteries of mathematics with a facility almost instinctive, while a memory, which never had any twilight hours, but always reflected a noontide clearness, seemed to magnify his acquisitions of ancient learning by the promptness with which they could be reproduced and applied. The circumstances of his position, too, had early contributed to give him an unusual command over the modern languages. An Englishman, and taught from his cradle to be proud of being an Englishman, he first evinced in speaking his native language those remarkable powers of expression, and that clear and happy elocution which ever afterwards distinguished him. But the son of a Spaniard, the sonorous syllables of that noble tongue constantly resounded in his ear, while the foreign guests who thronged his father's mansion habituated him from an early period of life to the tones of languages that were not long strange to him. When he was nineteen, Sidonia, who had then resided some time with his uncle at Naples, and had made a long visit to another of his father's relatives at Frankfurt, possessed a complete mastery over the principal European languages. At seventeen he had parted with Rebello, who returned to Spain, and Sidonia, under the control of his guardians, commenced his travels. He resided, as we have mentioned, some time in Germany, and then, having visited Italy, settled at Naples, at which city it may be said that he made his entrance into life. With an interesting person, and highly accomplished, he availed himself of the gracious attentions of a court of which he was the principal creditor, and which, treating him as a distinguished English traveller, were enabled perhaps to show him some favours that the manners of the country might not have permitted them to accord to his Neapolitan relatives. Sidonia thus obtained at an early age that experience of refined and luxurious society which is a necessary part of a finished education. It gives the last polish to the manners. It teaches us something of the power of the passions, early developed in the hotbed of self-indulgence. It instills into us that indefinable tact, seldom obtained in later life, which prevents us from saying the wrong thing, and often impels us to do the right. Between Paris and Naples, Sidonia passed two years, spent apparently in the dissipation which was perhaps inseparable from his time of life. He was admired by women, to whom he was magnificent, idolized by artists whom he patronized, received in all circles with great distinction, and appreciated for his intellect 
by the very few to whom he had all opened himself. For though affable and gracious, it was impossible to penetrate him. Though unreserved in his manner, his frankness was strictly limited to the surface. He observed everything, thought ever, but avoided serious discussion. If you pressed him for an opinion, he took refuge in raillery, or threw out some grave paradox with which it was not easy to cope. The moment he came of age, Sidonia, having previously at a great family congress held at Naples, made arrangements with the heads of the houses that bore his name, respecting the disposition and management of his vast fortune, quitted Europe. Sidonia was absent from his connections for five years, during which period he never communicated with them. They were aware of his existence only by the orders which he drew on them for payment, and which arrived from all quarters of the globe. It would appear from these documents that he had dwelt a considerable time in the Mediterranean regions, penetrated Nilotic Africa to Sennar and Abyssinia, traversed the Asiatic continent to Tartary, whence he had visited Hindustan and the isles of that Indian sea which is so little known. Afterwards he was heard of at Valparaiso, the Brazils, and Lima. He evidently remained some time in Mexico, which he quitted for the United States. One morning, without notice, he arrived in London. Sidonia had exhausted all the sources of human knowledge. He was master of the learning of every nation, of all tongues dead or living, of every literature, Western and Oriental. He had pursued the speculations of science to their last term, and had himself illustrated them by observation and experiment. He had lived in all orders of society, had viewed every combination of nature and of art, and had observed man under every phasis of civilization. He had even studied him in the wilderness. The influence of creeds and laws, manners, customs, traditions, in all their diversities, had been subjected to his personal scrutiny. He brought to the study of this vast aggregate of knowledge a penetrative intellect that, matured by long meditation and assisted by that absolute freedom from prejudice which was the compensatory possession of a man without a country, permitted Sidonia to fathom, as it were by intuition, the depth of questions apparently the most difficult and profound. He possessed the rare faculty of communicating with precision ideas the most abstruse, and in general a power of expression which arrests and satisfies attention. With all this knowledge, which no one knew more to prize, with boundless wealth and with an athletic frame which sickness had never tried and which had avoided excess, Sidonia nevertheless looked upon life with a glance rather of curiosity than content. His religion walled him out from the pursuits of a citizen, his riches deprived him of the stimulating anxieties of a man, he perceived himself a lone being, alike without cares and without duties. To a man in his position there might yet seem one unfailing source of felicity and joy, independent of creed, independent of country, independent even of character. He might have discovered that perpetual spring of happiness in the sensibility of the heart. But this was a sealed fountain to Sidonia. In his organization there was a peculiarity, perhaps a great deficiency. He was a man without affections. It would be harsh to say that he had no heart, for he was susceptible of deep emotions, but not for individuals. He was capable of rebuilding a town that was burned down, of restoring a colony that had been destroyed by some awful visitation of nature of redeeming to liberty a horde of captives, and of doing these great acts in secret, for, void of all self-love, public approbation was worthless to him, but the individual never touched him. Woman was to him a toy, man a machine. The lot the most precious to man, and which a beneficent providence has made not the least common, to find in another heart a perfect and profound sympathy, to unite his existence with one who could share all his joys, soften all his sorrows, aid him in all his projects, respond to all his fancies, counsel him in his cares, and support him in his perils, 
make life charming by her charms interesting by her intelligence and sweet by the vigilant variety of her tenderness to find your life blessed by such an influence and to feel that your influence can bless such a life this lot the most divine of divine gifts that power and even fame can never rival in its delights all this nature had denied to sidonia with an imagination as fiery as his native desert and an intellect as luminous as his native sky he wanted like the land those softening dews without which the soil is barren and the sunbeam is often a messenger of pestilence as an angel of regenerative grace such a temperament though rare is peculiar to the east it inspired the founders of the great monarchies of antiquity the prophets that the desert has sent forth the tartar chiefs who have overrun the world it might be observed in the great corsican who like most of the inhabitants of the mediterranean isles had probably arab blood in his veins it is a temperament that befits conquerors and legislators but in ordinary times and ordinary situations entails on its possessor only eccentric aberrations or profound melancholy the only human quality that interested sidonia was intellect he cared not whence it came where it was to be found creed country class character in this respect were alike indifferent to him the author the artist the man of science never appealed to him in vain often he anticipated their wants and wishes he encouraged their society was as frank in his conversation as he was generous in his contributions but the instant they ceased to be authors artists or philosophers and their communications arose from anything but the intellectual quality which had originally interested him the moment they were rash enough to approach intimacy and appeal to the sympathizing man instead of the congenial intelligence he saw them no more it was not however intellect merely in these unquestionable shapes that commanded his notice there was not an adventurer in europe with whom he was not familiar no minister of state had such communication with secret agents and political spies as sidonia he held relations with all the clever outcasts of the world the catalogue of his acquaintance in the shape of greeks armenians moors secret jews tartars gypsies wandering poles and carbonari would throw a curious light on those subterranean agencies of which the world in general knows so little but which exercise so great an influence on public events his extensive travels his knowledge of languages his daring and adventurous disposition and his unlimited means had given him opportunities of becoming acquainted with these characters in general so difficult to trace and of gaining their devotion to these sources he owed that knowledge of strange and hidden things which often startled those who listened to him nor was it easily scarcely possible to deceive him information reached him from so many and such contrary quarters that with his discrimination and experience he could almost instantly distinguish the truth the secret history of the world was his pastime his great pleasure was to contrast the hidden motive with the public pretext of transactions one source of interest sidonia found in his descent and in the fortunes of his race as firm in his adherence to the code of the great legislator as if the trumpet still sounded on sinai he might have received in the conviction of divine favour an adequate compensation for human persecution but there were other and more terrestrial considerations that made sidonia proud of his origin and confident in the future of his kind sidonia was a great philosopher who took comprehensive views of human affairs and surveyed every fact in its relative position to other facts the only mode of obtaining truth sidonia was well aware that in the five great varieties into which physiology has divided the human species to wit the caucasian the mongolian the malayan the american the ethiopian the arabian tribes rank in the first and superior class together among others with the saxon and the greek this fact alone is the source of great pride and satisfaction to the animal man 
but Sidonia and his brethren could claim a distinction which the Saxon and the Greek and the rest of the Caucasian nations have forfeited. The Hebrew is an unmixed race. Doubtless among the tribes who inhabit the bosom of the desert, progenitors alike of the Mosaic and the Mohammedan Arabs, blood may be found as pure as that of the descendants of the Sheikh Abraham. But the Mosaic Arabs are the most ancient, if not the only, unmixed blood that dwells in cities. An unmixed race of a first-rate organization are the aristocracy of nature. Such excellence is a positive fact, not an imagination, a ceremony coined by poets, blazoned by cousining heralds, but perceptible in its physical advantages and in the vigor of its unsullied idiosyncrasy. In his comprehensive travels, Sidonia had visited and examined the Hebrew communities of the world. He had found in general the lower orders debased, the superior immersed in sordid pursuits, but he perceived that the intellectual development was not impaired. And this gave him hope. He was persuaded that organization would outlive persecution. When he reflected on what they had endured, it was only marvellous that the race had not disappeared. They had defied exile, massacre, spoliation, the degrading influence of the constant pursuit of gain. They had defied time. For nearly three thousand years, according to Archbishop Usher, they have been dispersed over the globe, to the unpolluted current of their Caucasian structure, and to the segregating genius of their great lawgiver, Sidonia ascribed the fact that they had not been long ago absorbed among those mixed races who presume to persecute them, but who periodically wear away and disappear, while their victims still flourish in all the primeval vigor of the pure Asian breed. Shortly after his arrival in England, Sidonia repaired to the principal courts of Europe, that he might become personally acquainted with the monarchs and ministers of whom he had heard so much. His position ensured him a distinguished reception. His personal qualities immediately made him cherished. He could please, he could do more, he could astonish. He could throw out a careless observation which would make the oldest diplomatist start. A winged word that gained him the consideration, sometimes the confidence, of sovereigns. When he had fathomed the intelligence which governs Europe, and which can only be done by personal acquaintance, he returned to this country. The somewhat hard and literal character of English life suited one who shrank from sensibility, and often took refuge in sarcasm. Its masculine vigor and active intelligence occupied and interested his mind. Sidonia, indeed, was exactly the character who would be welcomed in our circles. His immense wealth, his unrivaled social knowledge, his clear, vigorous intellect, the severe simplicity of his manners, frank but neither claiming nor brooking familiarity, and his devotion to field sports, which was the safety valve of his energy, were all circumstances and qualities which the English appreciate and admire and it may fairly be said of Sidonia that few men were more popular and none less understood. End of chapter 11